to be able to say, I know he has heard me now. I will stand on my watchtower. I will look for my God and hear what he will say to my soul. Were you ever disappointed yet, Christian, when you prayed in faith and expected the answer? I bear my own testimony here this morning that I have never yet trusted him and found him to fail me. I have trusted man and have been deceived, but my God has never once denied the request I have made to him when I have backed up the request with belief in his willingness to hear and in the assurance of his promise. But I hear someone say, May we pray for temporals? Aye, that you may. In everything make known your wants to God. It is not merely for spiritual, but for everyday concerns. Take your smallest trials before Him. He is a God that heareth prayer. He is your household God as well as the God of the sanctuary. Be ever taking all that you have before God. As one good man who is about to be united with this church told me of his departed wife, Oh, said he, she was a woman that I could never get to do anything till she had made a matter of prayer of it. Be it what it might, she used to say, I must make it a matter of prayer. Oh, for more of this sweet habit of spreading everything before the Lord, just as Hezekiah did Rabshakeh's letter, and there leave it, saying, Thy will be done. I resign it to thee. Men say Mr. Mueller of Bristol is enthusiastic, because he will gather seven hundred children and believe that God will provide for them. Though there is nothing in the purse oftentimes, yet he believes it will come. My dear brethren, he is not an enthusiast. He is only doing what ought to be the commonplace action of every Christian man. He is acting upon a rule at which the worldling always must scoff because he does not understand it, a system which must always appear to the weak judgment of sense visionary and romantic, but which will never appear so to the child of God. He acts not upon common sense, but upon something higher than common sense, upon uncommon faith. Oh, that we had that uncommon faith to take God at His word! He cannot and he will not permit the man that trusteth in him to be ashamed or confounded. I have thus now, as best I could, set forth before you what I conceive to be four essentials of prevailing prayer. Whatsoever things ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Having thus asked you to look at the text, I want you now to look about you. Look about you at our meetings for prayer, and look about you at your private intercessions, and judge them both by the tenor of this text. First, look about you at the meetings for prayer. I cannot speak very pointedly in this matter, because I do honestly believe that the prayer meetings which are usually held among us have far less of the faults which I am about to indicate than any others I have ever attended. But still, they have some of the faults, and I hope that what we shall say will be taken personally home by every brother who is in the habit of engaging publicly in supplication at prayer meetings. Is it not a fact that as soon as you enter the meeting, you feel that if you are called upon to pray, you have to exercise a gift, and that gift, in the case of many praying men, to speak hardly perhaps, but I think honestly, lies in having a good memory to recollect a great many texts which always have been quoted since the days of our grandfather's grandfather, and to be able to repeat them in good, regular order. The gift lies also in some churches, especially in the village churches, in having strong lungs so as to be able to hold out without taking breath for five and twenty minutes when you are brief, and three quarters of an hour when you are rather drawn out. The gift lies also in being able not to ask for anything in particular, but in passing through a range of everything, making the prayer not an arrow with a point, but rather like a nondescript machine that has no point whatever, and yet is meant to be all point, which is aimed at everything, and consequently strikes nothing. 
Those brethren are often the most frequently asked to pray who have those peculiar and perhaps excellent gifts. Although I certainly must say that I cannot obey the Apostle's injunction in coveting very earnestly such gifts as these. Now, if instead thereof, some man is asked to pray who has never prayed before in public, suppose he rises and says, O Lord, I feel myself such a sinner that I can scarcely speak to Thee. Lord, help me to pray. O Lord, save my poor soul. O oh, that Thou would save my old companions. Lord, bless our minister. Be pleased to give us a revival. O oh, Lord, I can say no more. Hear me for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, then. You feel somehow as if you had begun to pray yourself. You feel an interest in that man, partly from fear lest he should stop, and also because you are sure that what he did say, he meant. And if another should get up after that and pray in the same spirit, you go out and say, This is real prayer. I would sooner have three minutes prayer like that than thirty minutes of the other sort because the one is praying, the other is preaching. Allow me to quote what the old preacher said upon the subject of prayer, and give it to you as a little word of advice. Remember, the Lord will not hear thee because of the arithmetic of thy prayers. He does not count their numbers. He will not hear thee because of the rhetoric of thy prayers. He does not care for the eloquent language in which they are conveyed. He will not listen to thee because of the geometry of thy prayers. He does not compute them by their length or by their breadth. He will not regard thee because of the music of thy prayers. He does not care for sweet voices nor for harmonious periods. Neither will he look at thee because of the logic of thy prayers, because they are well arranged and excellently comparted. But he will hear thee, and he will measure the amount of the blessing he will give thee, according to the divinity of thy prayers. If thou canst plead the person of Christ, and if the Holy Ghost inspire thee with zeal and earnestness, the blessings which thou shalt ask shall surely come unto thee. Brethren, I would like to burn the whole stock of old prayers that we have been using this fifty years, that oil that goes from vessel to vessel, that horse that rushes into the battle, that misquoted text, where two or three are met together, thou wilt be in the midst of them, and that to bless them, and all those other quotations which we have been manufacturing and dislocating and copying from man to man. I would we came to speak to God just out of our own hearts. It would be a grand thing for our prayer meetings. They would be better attended, and I am sure they would be more fruitful if every man would shake off that habit of formality and talk to God as a child talks to his father. Ask him for what we want, and then sit down and have done. I say this with all Christian earnestness. Often, because I have not chosen to pray in any conventional form, people have said, That man is not reverent. My dear sir, you are not a judge of my reverence. To my own master I stand or fall. I do not think that Job quoted anybody. I do not think that Jacob quoted the old saint in heaven, his father Abraham. I do not find Jesus Christ quoted Scripture in prayer. They did not pray in other people's words, but they prayed in their own. God does not want you to go gathering up those excellent but very musty spices of the old sanctuary. He wants the new oil just distilled from the fresh olive of your own soul. He wants spices and frankincense, not of the old chests, where they've been lying until they've lost their savor. But he wants fresh incense and fresh myrrh brought from the ophir of your own soul's experience. Look well to it that you really pray. Do not learn the language of prayer, but seek the spirit of prayer. And God Almighty bless you, and make you more mighty in your supplications.'